The first Belt and Road Summit is history, and there is broad recognition that it was a great success. To ameliorate endemic problems of the developing world, China's President Xi Jinping combined the grand vision of what he called the Project of the Century with bold, specific commitments of resources and financing. The goal is no less than transforming the developing world's economy. Revivifying globalization, alleviating poverty, and reducing severe imbalances. Yet, implementing projects will prove more difficult than proposing them, and I have concerns. Seeking rapid results can cause hasty decisions. Praising long term benefits can mask short term obstacles. Ignoring China's benefits can breed suspicions. For a post Belt and Road Summit report, we start by analyzing President Xi's speech and China's commitments. Then we examine China's benefits. Finally, we assess whether China can sustain its commitments. That's how we keep closer to China. When China's President Xi Jinping hosts 29 heads of state and government, the not so subtle message is that China is thinking globally. The two-day Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation, held in Beijing in May, exemplifies China's rising status and President Xi's growing influence. Addressing a roundtable summit of state leaders, Xi spoke of a world fraught with challenges, sluggish trade and investment, wobbly globalization, increasingly uneven development, massive flows of refugees and migrants, as well as wars, conflicts, and terrorism. He called the Belt and Road Initiative a project of the century. No country can tackle the challenges or solve the world's problems on its own. Individual countries need to coordinate national policies and make good use of economic factors and development resources on a greater global scale. Only in this way can we build synergy and promote peace, stability and common development in the world. To date, 68 countries and international organizations have signed agreements with China on Belt and Road cooperation. Chinese investment has surpassed $50 billion, and in the three years, 2014 to 2016, total trade has exceeded $3 trillion U.S. dollars. A multidimensional infrastructure network is taking shape, featuring large-scale economic corridors and land-sea-air transportation routes, and supported by major rail, port, and pipeline projects. And China is pledging to increase its investment. China will scale up financing support for the Belt and Road Ini Initiative by contributing an additional 100 billion RMB to the Silk Road Fund. And we encourage financial institutions to conduct overseas RMB fund business with an estimated amount of about 300 billion RMB. You know, everybody has to make joint efforts, and I think we are doing everything, whatever we can, and now we'll take more mayors, more extraordinary mayors to overcome these difficulties. Instead of giving pledges only, what they're doing is they're going immediately into projects. So this way the pipeline moves very fast. I think the Belt and Road Initiative will play a very important role for China and for its neighboring countries. It will facilitate economic cooperation and cultural exchanges on the global stage. We live in a world where there are uh, too many misunderstandings between different religions, different cultures. So this is not only a material development project, this is a project to bring people together. This is not something only for development, it's also for peace. We weren't sure because, uh, you know, at first this was just going to be kind of a a, a forum where we sign agreements, just you know, a, a very, um, a, a, a very much uh, political and formal, which is really important. Uh, but now I think what people are already saying, just just after a few hours, we should do this again. We should continue to come back. We should work through the the details of how to make uh, the One Belt One Road project really reach its full potential. <laughs> so uh, I, I think already it's been a great success. Uh, but moreover. 
what you have, what you're hearing now is people saying, so how do we make it happen every year? How do we make it happen so that uh, we're uh, the next time, instead of signing agreements and, and just introducing ideas, we're actually working on making them happen. We, we saw China take uh, 800 million people out of poverty in four decades. I think that's the potential of trade. A lot of this was about trade and connectivity. Uh, I'm sure that if we can replicate that, if we can make sure that more people participate, small and medium enterprises participate, with better connectivity, with electronic commerce, with digital connectivity, that's the key to have more people benefiting from this. To assess the Belt and Road Summit, I speak with three thought leaders. Zhang Dawei, Vice Chairman of China Center for International Economic Exchanges, Professor Wang Wei Chao, President of the Chinese Academy of Socialism, and Professor Huang Ping, Director of the Institute of European Studies, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, what's your impression so far? Uh, for the morning session, I would feel very enthusiastic and excited because it was actually more than I expected. Even I've been partly <laughs> in this uh, already for about four years, mainly with Europe, uh, Central Eastern Europe in particular. Mm. But after listening to President Xi's as well as other President's speeches, I feel this Belt Road Initiative now is uh, something under its uh, second phase or second mm. stage. Mm. President Xi has emphasized the importance of the uh, initiative still, if we call it the initiative, but for the purpose of peace, prosperity, uh, mutual benefiting to all, and uh, also by the newly uh, investment or uh, input contribution from Chinese side, uh, the win-win solution can be more uh, realistic. And uh, he also emphasized the matches between the development programs and initiatives mm. from Chinese side and others. Professor Wang, from your perspective, from a political point of view and a social development point of view, how do you assess President Xi's speech at the Belt and Road uh, Forum, the summit? In Chinese culture, whenever you want to do something, you should first explain yourself. So by correcting the terminology, we are clarifying our purpose, defining the intention of the Belt and Road Initiative from a comprehensive and in-depth perspective. That is, we strive for peace and cooperation, openness and inclusiveness, mutual learning and mutual benefit, which is not only the spirit of the initiative, but also the guiding principles for China's diplomacy. There is a prevalent belief in Chinese culture. If you're rich, you should contribute to world prosperity. Otherwise, you manage to take care of yourself. China is now in a position between being rich and poor and has to consider both its own well-being and how, with continuous development, it can attain its goal of contributing to global prosperity. I think this cultural characteristic is in the DNA of every Chinese. We see it in many impoverished places. People will not refuse to help others just because their family is not that well off. Therefore, achieving win-win results by helping others is part of Chinese culture and also an inherent trait hardwired in every Chinese. <laughs> Since the latter half of last year, the international community has witnessed a lot of uncertainties, especially with Brexit and the governing philosophy of Donald Trump that advocate anti-globalization, trade protectionism, and only caring about their own interests. Against this backdrop, China as the largest developing country and the country enjoying fastest growth became quite influential as it has the second largest economy in the world. 
If we follow Donald Trump and only care about our own interests by advocating individualism, trade protectionism, and going against globalization, then the whole world will disintegrate. I think at this point it's highly relevant for the Chinese people and the government to take on the burden and declare to the world that we are sticking with the economic globalization, safeguarding trade globalization and preventing the world from spinning away from the right track. That is why it matters. It creates in some people's mind in the West a suspicion that uh, China can't be so charitable, so altruistic that it wants to help the whole world. China must be benefiting in some way, and if they're not telling me how they're benefiting, then it may be the benefit is in very subtle ways, which makes me nervous, political or military or some other kind of way. So I like to expose this and talk about very openly how China benefits from the Belt and Road Initiative. What are the benefits of China? President Xi talks about win-win. Well, win-win means China wins too. And that, that makes it sustainable. So from your analysis, from the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, how does China benefit? How does China win from that? If we look at our neighboring countries, especially countries in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and even Eastern Europe, they are all 10 or 20 years, even 30 years behind China in terms of development. For example, I went to Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan the year before. The high infrastructure construction capacity in China is just what they need. So through the Belt and Road Initiative, we are creating a circular economy where resources, manpower, finance and commodities can be allocated globally for win-win results. In this way, we can help others meet their demands while generating income. This is how the economy gets revitalized. The guiding principle for the Belt and Road Initiative is mutual benefit for win-win and all win results. For example, let's look at the commodity and the industrial development. We can enhance commodity exchanges with countries along the Belt and Road and speed up the trade flow to open up a market for all. Now the railway from China to Eastern Europe is already in use, and those extending to Southern and Western Europe will follow. In this way, trade flow between countries will occur more often and get upgraded to a new level. China's market gets expanded and so do theirs. China is not doing charity in promoting trade flow and industrial complementation. Goods and services are not offered for free. We ask for returns in accordance with the market principle based on the law of value. Everything is for mutual benefit. Look at the train carrying Chinese commodities to Central and even Western Europe. They don't come back empty. They carry goods from those countries as well. The law of value is followed to give us mutual benefits. This is the approach or the measure we take to promote common trade and industrial prosperity. The province where I worked is inland. It used to be quite closed, but then it took the chance through the Belt and Road Initiative and successfully turned its economic system to a new one that's open to the outside world and truly promotes development. Therefore, I think China's Belt and Road Initiative benefits not only the international community, but also China and its surrounding countries. It brings tremendous opportunities to landlocked provinces in particular. As long as we take the opportunity, the chances are great for boosting economic growth, development and prosperity. All G20 economies were represented at the Belt and Road Forum which was attended by some 1,500 representatives from over 130 countries and over 70 international organizations. These countries account for more than two-thirds of the global population and 90% of the world's gross domestic product. More than 4,000 journalists covered the forum. 
which was the most prestigious international gathering China has ever hosted. As China prepares for the 2017 BRICS summit in Xiamen in September, political analysts agree that the past few years has marked China's transition from a player in global affairs to a leader of the global agenda. Projecting a positive image is only part of China's motivation driving the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, some critics would say that this is uh, exemplification of China's effort to uh, have a, an increasing role towards a, um, if not a dominance in, in, a, in, a, in a 19th century sense, but uh, where China would be becoming again the center of the world. So China would elevate itself over others through this uh, soft power, through this influence of its economy, uh, its military in, in, a, in a softer way. It's, uh, it's soft power, it's social activity, but it would, it would mean that through this Belt and Road uh, 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 initiative that ultimately China would become the center of the world. All roads would lead through into uh, China. So that creates in some people, even though it's wonderful economic development for many countries, some people are concerned that this gives validity to the so-called China threat. It's not a direct military threat, but it's a long-term um, strategy uh, to become the most uh, uh, central and dominant country in the world. In ritual respect, we know that China has never been a country that favors invading others. Never in history, indeed. And realistically speaking, we Chinese are not that qualified to invade others anyway, because we are still a developing country. Huge imbalances exist in our country. President Xi promised in the forum that China will allocate another 100 billion RMB of investment to the Silk Road Fund, 300 billion RMB to encourage financial institutions to conduct overseas, and 60 billion of supporting funds. This is an enormous amount of input, totaling over 800 billion RMB. To be honest, this has aroused debates within our country. China is not that rich yet. We still have 70 to 80 million people living under the poverty line. There are even voices saying cities in China are like Europe while countryside is like Africa. So China has a lot to do in terms of improving people's livelihood. Under such circumstances, China is offering a huge amount of money to promote the Belt and Road Initiative. China can behave just like Trump and only mind our own business. The country has 1.3 billion people and 9.6 million square kilometers of land and 4.7 million square kilometers of maritime space. That's more than enough. So what for? Because we should be held accountable for the world and fulfill our obligations. Despite the fact that living standards are improving in China, there are still many people leading a hard and impoverished life elsewhere. So we want to go to another country where road conditions are bad and people find it hard to lend a helping hand. Through the Belt and Road Initiative, China wants to build infrastructure first and help others improve their living standards and achieve a win-win situation. So, under that situation, some families are ready to go with China's proposal because it is mutually beneficial, while others want to consider what the more wealthy families think. Some families or countries may also serve as the policeman of the village. Some may also serve as the village head and may hesitate and wait to see reactions around. There are also families who just doubt these Chinese practices. They will wonder, what do you mean? Are you trying to seek votes? Are you trying to be the village head? In fact, President Xi expressed one concept quite clearly. We are not trying to be the village head. Instead, we are seeking common development. I believe many guests present at the Belt and Road Forum demonstrated that people now have a deeper understanding of General Secretary Xi's One Belt and One Road Initiative.
理解加深了。You bring up a very good point in terms of China's commitment because China is making a very large commitment to the Belt and Road Initiative through different tranches in、uh, direct investment, in、uh, bank loans, and soft loans. Uh, when China itself is a developing country, and as you said,、uh, parts of China look like Africa,、um, and therefore there are different voices in China that are concerned about the level of commitment that China is making. So, how sustainable is China's、uh, commitment? Because the kinds of projects we're talking about with Belt and Road are not measured in years; they're measured in decades. Because you're dealing with infrastructure. And infrastructure takes 20 to minimum 30 years or more to have efficient paybacks because of the nature of infrastructure. So,、uh, how, how sustainable is this? Is there concern among uh, Chinese uh, thought leaders,、uh, economists, political scientists like yourself that China is making commitments that are wonderful and the world needs it, but circumstances may be that China may not be able to fulfill. Its commitments, and then would look bad because China was unable to do what it promised. We are soberly aware that China is surrounded mainly by developing countries in Central Asia, West Asia, and East Asia. Extremely wealthy countries won't do things like the Belt and Road Initiative. Frankly speaking, China cannot afford to keep paying out, which is unsustainable. That is why we propose mutual benefits and win-win cooperations on an equal footing. That is, China should be rewarded by paying the bill. The bill is footed through banks, such as the AIIB. What does AIIB do? If a country wants to build a project, you need to declare, and I need to evaluate. The loan is not free aid. That is not the case. In economics, there is no such thing as free lunch. We can offer low interests, but you have to pay the interest. 中国还是一个本身也是个发展国家，呃，自己还有相当多的贫困人口。China itself is a developing country and is home to a large number of people living in poverty. Per capita GDP is rather low. Globally, China ranks around 80 in terms of economic development. We still have a long way to go. We have confidence to embark on a better road and spare no efforts to go quicker. We have proposed to move up our value chain to medium and high end and keep a medium and high growth rate. We don't hope to enjoy the growth alone, but to share it with the international community. I believe President Xi has made this idea pretty clear. We are all very supportive. I am convinced more and more people from the international community will support the idea. But you're saying that in addition to the economic development, people-to-people -people exchanges. Is、yes. also a critical part. Yes.、Uh, uh, why is that the case? Because even a good economic project program, either investment or trade, if there was no、uh, people-to-people understanding exchanges, a good project can easily turn out in a disaster、uh, as unintended consequences. 古老的丝绸之路精神呢？ Then the Belt and Road Initiative, in addition to promoting trade flow and regional prosperity, also creates a channel for people-to-people -people exchange and cultural integration. Different people, different cultures, and different religions exist in harmony for inclusive development. It matters a lot. Without sufficient social and cultural exchanges, pure economic cooperation is not enough for us. Through my research, I found a lot of religions in Quanzhou: Buddhism, Islam, Catholicism, Christianity, Manichaeism, Taoism. All exist in harmony. All enjoy peace and development. Many Islamic merchants and future generation settled down in Quanzhou afterward. So actually, commodity exchanges along the Maritime Silk Road comes with people and people exchanges. So what we see are typical features of openness and inclusiveness. What this means is that we should be forward-looking instead of being short-sighted when it comes to materials and currencies. 
True, country-to-country country exchange starts with commodities, but along with commodities, there are cultural exchanges that are carried through. So essentially, we are promoting the exchange of different peoples with different cultural values. What are some examples of people-to-people -people exchanges uh, in science, arts, uh, the public education, diplomacy, education, education, media, media uh, younger generations, exchange students, exchanges, uh, students as well as uh, even uh, workers who do the construction oh, okay. infrastructures are also part of this people-to-people uh, -people exchanges. So not only uh, sort of narrowly uh, cultural negativities. Oh, oh, okay, well, well, well this is a very interesting point yes. because normally we think of people, people's exchanges as uh, art so troops going arts, back and forth yeah, yeah. and that's good, more than that. but you're saying it's more yeah. than that. In many Indeed. countries, Indeed. Uh, Chinese workers, there have been problems with local workers. Right, uh, right. One, local one may reason, think this is a kind of competition. A competition or uh, the, the Chinese workers. Some workers kind of know on the idea about the local cultures, right, religions, and, and traditions. And they may whatever. do something offensive or not Yes, not yes. knowing what is going on, and in, in general, local workers may feel jealousy that it's like an invasion <laughs> yes, of Chinese yes. workers right, taking right. their jobs. Yeah, so we have uh, workers for those programs, uh, uh, projects. We have tourists, and increasingly more oh, and more tourists, Chinese yeah, tourists yeah. everywhere. We have students, of course. President Xi's Belt and Road Initiative is crucial for the developing world's economy and thus vital for the peace and prosperity of the entire world. That's why I focus on its challenges, obstacles, possible pitfalls. Only by anticipating problems can success be optimized. One concern is that officials may be over-anxious to show results too quickly. Long-run success depends on planning, structuring, and operating projects properly with highest standards of analysis, monitoring, and controls. Considering the instability of many Belt and Road countries, how will China react if its assets and workers are threatened? There is also the danger of high expectations, such that countries whose wish list is not fulfilled will be disappointed and may blame China. Think tanks must think boldly, anticipate challenges, obstacles, and pitfalls, and plan for contingencies, diverse scenarios, and unpleasant surprises. Our next benchmark comes in two years. President Xi announced that the next Belt and Road Summit will be held in 2019. We'll be there, keeping closer to China.